So I want to thank Rachel for the kind introduction, although as a nerd for social justice, I feel like I should have a pocket protector on right now. Um, so, uh, and I also understand the qualifications about economists that said if you took all the economists in the world and laid them end to end, they still couldn't reach a conclusion. Uh, <laughs> It's also been said about economists, if you took all the economists in the world and laid them end to end, that might be a good thing. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit about really sort of movement building to transform the situations that we see ourselves in. I'll get into that in just a second. I always like to let audiences know when I start to speak that while I'm talking, my voice might break a little bit. Uh, it's not that I'm emotional being with you. Uh, although, clearly, Bioneers is a high point of anyone's life. Uh, it's actually that I have a speech condition called spasmodic dysphonia, spasms around your voice box, uh, that can cause your voice to break. Um, many famous people have it, Diane Rehm, Robert Kennedy Jr., and now me. So, <laughs> America is changing, uh, and it's now projected that by the year uh, 2042, 2043, that the United States will be a so-called majority minority, or as I like to think of it, all minority all the time, uh, <laughs> country. Uh, California crossed that threshold some time ago. And when people see that demographic change going on, they tend to think that what must be driving it is immigration. That's certainly what drove it in the past. But that is no longer the case. Immigration into the country has slowed down dramatically. In fact, net migration from Mexico over the last three years has been zero. And what's actually driving the change now is the change in the youth population. This shows you for the last 10 years what happened to, for example, the number of young whites. It fell, the number of young whites in the country, by 4.3 million. Now, that does not mean that 4.3 million young white people died. <laughs> we would have noticed that. <laughs> it would have been reported on Fox News. <laughs> it would have been blamed on Obamacare. You know that would have happened. <laughs> <laughs> what it means is that more uh, people are moving into 19 and 20 than are moving into 1 and 2. And at the same time, the number of young African-Americans fell slightly. Some of that's re-identification into the multiracial category. The number of young Latinos in the country grew by 4.8 million. The number of young Asian Pacific Islanders by 800,000. That's the next America. And the next America is also facing a significant crisis in terms of the growing inequality in the United States. This is a graph showing you the share of income going to the top 1%. Two peaks to notice here, 1928, the year before the Great Depression, 2007, the year before the Great Recession. Coincidence? I don't think so. Uh, but we've got a changing demography, we've got growing inequality, and we need to be able to address that issue. And the way that we need to address that issue is by combining projects, policy, and power by using the demonstration of what alternative worlds could look like project, by making sure that those things actually become public policy, but the only thing that really moves public policy into being is power. And power, in fact, also comes from social movements. Social movements are sustained groupings that develop a frame, a narrative, a story about where we need to head in the future and begin to build a broad base that helps to create long-term transformations in power. For example, one dramatically important movement in the last couple of years has been the Dreamers. And imagine that, a ragtag group of people young people who quote unquote have no right to be in the country somehow standing up for their rights as human beings and being able to force the president into deferred action for childhood adjustment and essentially probably in the next few months force the president into administrative relief. How did they do it? 
How did they do it? They developed a story about them being dreamers and wanting to contribute to the United States. They rooted themselves deeply in the values that uh, appealed to many different people, but they also had a strategy to shift the balance of power. They challenged not only Republicans in the Congress, but the President himself by threatening to occupy his campaign offices in 2012. That's how change happens. Now, we've been researching this for years. This uh, shows you a great book you should buy. This could be the start of something big that I wrote a few years ago. Um, uh, it is available on Amazon.com. For those of you who are not big readers, it's about to be made into a major motion picture <laughs> in which I'll be portrayed by Antonio Banderas, so I'm very excited about this. <laughs> But since that book, we've been looking at how do you make social movements, inter-ethnic youth organizing for social justice, how do you build alliances, uh, how do you measure movements, and then how do you transform that into electoral power. And in doing that, we realized that we could come up with a long bunch of research and literature review, or we could borrow a page from David Letterman and come out with a top 10 list. And so these are the top 10 elements that we think contribute to movement building. And I'll go through them, but they're fundamental elements, implementation, implementation tools, and scale. On the fundamental side, movements are all about a vision and a frame. Van Jones, an early attendee at Bioneers, reminds us that Martin Luther King did not go to the steps of the Lincoln uh, Monument and declare, I have an issue. <laughs> Which too many of us do, right? Instead, he declared, I have a dream. So movements are about a dream, about a vision, about a narrative that's deeply rooted in values, but it helps to frame people's understanding. Movements have to have an authentic base in key organizing and real constituencies that face challenges and issues. So a lot of times, people will say they've got a movement when really all they have is a Twitter handle. So, what we need to look for is movements that are actually engaging an authentic base and are developing leaders at that base. A third element of movements is a commitment to the long haul. You cannot change things in an episodic way. You have to really root yourselves in for a very long struggle, and that means having a perspective about the long haul. The fourth thing that we think is really clear for movements to be able to be successful is they actually have to have an underlying theory of the economy. Now, I'm not just saying that because I'm an economist, although I'm sure that influences my thinking. <laughs> Social movements are fundamentally about redistributing opportunities. They are about creating a path uh, for the undocumented, they are about taking care of a next generation by protecting the planet now. They are about redistributing resources. And unless we are able to also show that in the process of that redistribution, everyone gets to be, at least in some sense, better off, the planet gets protected, immigration reform helps the economy, uh, it becomes difficult to move things forward. So it's important to have an underlying and viable economic model. You need to have a theory of government and governance and a real strategy about how to play an inside and outside game. Too often, we're simply outside protesting. We're not inside working with the political folks who can help to make change. Will they make change all on their own? Of course not. Anybody who, when President Obama got elected the first time, thought the world would actually change was obviously wrong. Uh, <laughs> And part of that is that when Obama got elected, essentially a lot of people sort of bum-rushed Washington trying to see whether or not they could shift policy there. When what we really should have done is gone back to our grassroots community and build the power that would either force the president to do the right thing or to put wind at his back. So we need a vision of government and governance, and we need a knowledge about how to play that inside and outside game. The sixth thing, and I say this not only because I'm a nerd, is that we need a scaffold of solid research. It is increasingly important to have research be backing up what we're talking about. 
One of the things that led the living wage campaigns to be so successful in the United States is that each one did a significant amount of research in the municipality first to show why a living wage would be good for low-income people, why it wouldn't bust the budget of the local municipality, and why it wouldn't cause unemployment. A similar thing is going on with the wage that's uh, the research being produced about the minimum wage uh, and a number of other things. Research is incredibly important. The seventh thing is that we actually need a pragmatic policy package. Many of us wind up having a big vision, but no first steps. No way to actually figure out how we're going to deliver on the things that we promise. And so it can become very useful to call for uh, justice in terms of policing, but what does that mean in terms of strategies to do community policing? How do you build relationships between police and community? We are deeply concerned about the over-incarceration of young men of color, but what does that mean in terms of realignment? What does that mean in terms of gang intervention? What does that mean in terms of pragmatic policy package? This is important because Americans are a particularly pragmatic group of people. And unless you can actually demonstrate that you can make things better with your own point of view, it's often very difficult to get people to support you. Uh, number eight, uh, is that we actually need to recognize the need for scale to change things. We have big problems. And sometimes when people look at those big problems, they look at the smallest groups and they say, oh, that group, it's small. It must be very authentic. It might just be small. In Los Angeles, we've got big anchor organizations like SCOPE in South LA, Community Coalition in South LA, Inner City Struggle in East Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy, Communities for a Better Environment that's up here as well. These are big, sizable organizations that can actually move people, move dialogue, move policy. We need to figure out how to scale while retaining authenticity by staying in touch with the grassroots. That means that we need to scale organizationally, but we also need to scale in terms of movements, something I'll get back to in just a second. Uh, number nine, if we're going to do that, we actually need to have a strategy for scaling up that is geographic in part. How many of you know that book about the right wing in Kansas called What's the Matter with Kansas? Okay. And the right wing had a very successful notion, which is they made sure that something was wrong in Kansas so they could infect the rest of the country. And it is from Kansas, for example, that all the anti-immigrant legislation has been spreading out through Chris uh, Corbeck, their uh, Secretary of State. The geography of change means taking root in some particular locations, building power in those locations, and then winding creating, wind up creating uh, change. And one important way in which people are doing that is by doing metropolitan work, trying to organize the Bay Area, trying to organize Los Angeles, trying to organize the Central Valley, and then trying to connect all those big metro areas into one strategy for scaling up, particularly in California. The last thing, which I think is very, very important, and this is really what's distinctive about movements, is their willingness to network with other organizations. You know, when uh, my friend Anthony Thigpen, who had scope in South LA, has a great expression. He says that some organizations are about building empires and others are about building movements. Are you trying to build your own organization or are you trying to network in and build the ecosystem that can actually support change. Do you realize how significant it is that the sister from Missouri got up here and instead of talking about climate change, instead talked about police brutality in Ferguson? <laughs> Do you realize how crucial it is when an undocumented student, a dreamer, speaks up for LGBT rights or the LGBT community talks about the importance of immigration reform? If we want to have a river of change, we need to make sure that we're flowing together. We need to make sure that what we're trying to do is to support one another. Quick example, group in Los Angeles I work with a lot, Community Coalition. I, you know, so close I actually lift weights with their executive director. <laughs> so. They've asked me to do some things over the year. The one year, the one thing they asked me to do that they absolutely insisted that I do was help them with strategic planning 
for their sister organization in East Los Angeles. Because they realized that unless they built up the organization in East Los Angeles, a different organization, they wouldn't have a broad basis for the school reform strategies that would be citywide. Are you building your empire or are you building the ecosystem? So what does this mean moving ahead? I think in terms of moving ahead that it's important to do a couple of different things as we think. One is to make sure that as we gauge the success of movements that we measure what matters. Now, many of you know that Albert Einstein said some important things, and anything that sounds important and intelligent gets attributed to Albert Einstein. <laughs> so I'm not sure he actually said this, but he should have. <laughs> not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. And we too often focus in on transactions, deals, the number of people we bring to a meeting rather than transformations, how we're developing leaders, how we're developing empathy for, empathy for one another, how we're building movements that link together. You can see a different way of doing that by looking at the campaign that happened in, La, in California uh, around uh, Proposition 23, which was the oil company-sponsored bill to try to reverse AB 32, the Global Warming Act here. It was actually sponsored by two uh, oil companies out of Texas. And it was a successful uh, movement that wound up voting no on Proposition 23. Uh, people were brought there, there were good vote results, etc. But there was something very significant that happened during the campaign against Proposition 23, which was that it was mostly people of color that were pushing against Prop 23, trying to protect the global warming legislation because of the need to protect uh, their uh, communities. Indeed, here's an interesting little statistic for you to know that's been consistent in the polling data in California for the last 10 years. What group in the United States, in California, do you think is most concerned about the environment, uh, most worried about climate change, most wanting the state to do even more to uh, sustain the fight against uh, global warming? <laughs> Latinos. It's kind of interesting, because I know what, you might be thinking the same thing. We traditionally, when we thought of environmentalists, we thought of white people with Birkenstocks, right? <laughs> I see you, right? <laughs> but when you look at the polling data for the last 10 years, Latinos are more concerned about the environment than white voters in the United States, but I think in California, by about 12 percentage points. African Americans and Asian Pacific Islanders as well. And what the CAC campaign helped do is make people begin to realize that important fact. One other little thing about this, within the Latino community, the group most concerned about global warming, most wanting the state to do something, immigrants. So it's the reverse of what most people think, it has a lot to do with the proximity of the air and all sorts of issues like that. The other thing that we need to do as we're thinking about building movements is to not think of a moment, but think of a movement. You know, Occupy Wall Street was a moment that never became a movement because people weren't willing to suggest themselves to the discipline of power building, of strategizing, of scaling, of those 10 elements that I talked about. Um, finally, uh, we need to understand that when we're doing this movement work, it's not simply about changing the world, but about changing ourselves at the same time. <laughs> Little footnote, changing yourself is not enough though, right? So uh, the other thing that we need to do is to link together changing the world and uh, changing ourselves, because what happens in the process of being part of a movement is that you develop a very different concept of who you are, the empathy for others, your concern for the planet, etc., and you begin to develop a different kind of leadership as well. And when, when I think about the kind of leadership that we need, I'm reminded of a uh, thing I used to conduct at UC Santa Cruz where I lived for a while. <laughs> Go slugs. Um, or as I used to think of them, the fighting banana slugs, right? So 
And we used to run a thing there called the Summer Institute Social Change Across Borders that brought together organizers from Latin America with Latino organizers uh, in California and through the rest of the United States to try to build transnational ties. We were doing this about 10, 15 years ago before it became quite as hip as it is. And in, at the end of one of those institutes, one organizer, a guy named uh, Victor uh, uh, Quintano from Sinaloa, Mexico, uh, he leaned back and said, there's only two kind of leaders in this world, leaders who like the game of chess and leaders who like the jigsaw puzzle. And like you, we were looking at him going, Victor, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> and what he said is that in chess, uh, there's only two different colors, usually black and white. In the jigsaw puzzle, there are many different colors, and indeed, a single piece can be multi-hued. In chess, some pieces are far more powerful than others. You are always bummed out when you lose your queen, particularly to a pawn. <laughs> In the jigsaw puzzle, every piece is important. And you know that sense of frustration when you get to the end and one or two are missing? And you know it's your kids, right? In chess, you literally get ahead by knocking somebody off their territory. You gentrify them. In the jigsaw puzzle, you get ahead by fitting the pieces together so seamlessly that you don't know where one ends and another begins. In chess, the object is to win. In the jigsaw puzzle, the object is to complete the tapestry. We have been playing way too much chess and not enough jigsaw puzzle. If we're going to build a movement for justice, for the planet, for the next generation, start playing some jigsaw. Thank you. Yeah.